Welcome all to a new speaker series. My name is Christoph Wilke. I'm a professor of business ethics at the Technical University uh, of Munich and director of the Institute for Ethics in AI. With our speaker series, we invite experts from all over the world to talk about ethics and governance of AI. And these events serve as an important platform for us to share new research and exchange knowledge. Since our launch in 2019, we have been holding 39 speaker series events with distinguished guests from all over the world. Today's topic is generative AI systems, ethical and society issues and implications in the AI Act. And we have the pleasure of having Raja Chatila with us. He is Professor Emeritus of Artificial Intelligence, Robotics and Ethics at Sorbonne University, Paris. Um, he contributed in several areas of AI and autonomous and interactive robotics along his career. Uh, his research interests are currently focused on human robot interaction, machine learning, and ethics. And I've had the pleasure to meet you on a number of occasions. For example, when we were both members of the AI for People group, um, you are also an IEEE fellow and you were president of the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society in 2014 and 15. Uh, you have also been a member of the EU high-level expert group on AI and a co-chair of the Responsible AI Working Group with a Global Partnership on AI. And finally, you are also chair of the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems and member of the CNPN National Pilot Committee on Digital Ethics in France. So uh, we will start with a presentation and afterwards we will have the opportunity to hear your questions and comments. We will try to answer for as many questions as possible. And Raja, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rodger. Thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm very honored to be in this place uh, and to share some thoughts with you. So my talk is about generative AI systems, ethical and societal issues, implications in the AI Act, which means I will not speak about uh, the uh, industrial developments of uh, AI systems and generative systems. I won't speak about the advantages of using them. I'm going to focus on, yes, the dark side, if you wish. And uh, I will also uh, speak about the regulatory framework for, uh, for these systems and how it could be uh, applicable and which with, with, with which difficulties. So uh, the, my outline is that I will start by introducing uh, or uh, recalling what are those uh, systems exactly, how basically how they work. Uh, then what are the issues or why do we need ethics and governance? Uh, because uh, if there were no issues, uh, governance wouldn't be so much stringent. And uh, how this is translated in the AI Act, specifically about generative systems. The AI Act, as you know, is globally about AI and AI systems, but there are some uh, <clears throat> articles uh, specifically about generative systems, and we will uh, survey more or less quickly uh, these articles and see if there are some topics that need to be addressed further. Uh, I'll hope, I hope, because when I start speaking, I, was, I don't stop usually. Uh, <laughs> so please <laughs> give me some sign like if, to, leave, to leave time for questions like 15 minutes, hopefully. So uh, two, two things about generative systems. Uh, recalling first uh, how we can generate images, artificial synthetic images. Uh, so the basic principles and the uh, one of the first uh, papers on this was uh, a paper by uh, Goodfellow and other colleagues, uh, including Joshua Benjo, uh, which dates back to 2014. And uh, this paper uh, is about the introduction of, of generative adversarial networks, GAN, and, and uh, more focused on image generation. So the principle of this um, approach is very clever. It's to uh, build a system where two neural networks compete together. And uh, the purpose of this competition is to imitate a data set. So you have here, for example, a data set of images. 
some of you might have recognized his Picasso style, but these are not real Picasso pictures. It's something I have generated. So these are uh, 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 images here, and this is the training set that we want to imitate. What does it mean? It means we want the system to provide outputs that uh, can probably belong to the data set, but are not actually in the data set. Uh, so the idea is that you have two networks. The first one uh, produces uh, an output which tries to imitate the uh, data set, which means it tries to capture the distribution uh, of the, of the uh, training data. How? Well, uh, you have here this training data and you have an image which is a random noise, noise and this image, the random noise, will be transformed uh, to look like something which, look, which is in the data set. Uh, this goes to a second uh, network. Uh, this network uh, knows about the data set. It, it receives also this output. And its task is to discriminate if this actually probably belongs to, to the training set or not. So either it belongs or it doesn't with a probability. And then this is back propagated to improve the behavior of the generator, producing better and better images in terms of their uh, 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 resemblance with the training set, and uh, improving also this one to discriminate. Uh, when, it, when the system converges, it's like a game actually played by two players, uh, two players, competing players, and there is a, uh, a point of uh, equilibrium, and uh, when the system converges, it means that this discriminator uh, has uh, not the ability to discriminate anymore. It, it will say, yes, uh, it belongs, uh, which means this one became a, 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 a forger, <laughs> a very competent forger. Uh, so uh, in this way, you can produce images that uh, actually can imitate uh, any data distribution you give it. And this is a very, again, a very uh, clever approach that is being used today also to generate artificial synthetic images, uh, which are not real, don't represent reality. They represent a, a given distribution that has been fed. And as a result, since that year and today, you have a lot of deep fakes which are images showing people doing things that they never done, for example. So, but these are part of generative systems and several uh, programs, DALI, et cetera, use this approach. There are different approaches, but this is one of the main and first approaches. Now, we have also something a little bit uh, newer, which uh, dates back to 2017, which is large language model it's based on, on architecture, which was introduced in 2017. It's called Transformers uh, by Vaswani and Al uh, from Google. Uh, uh, so the <clears throat> idea here is to address text language. Now, images uh, have been a long time target to AI systems and many, many uh, developments and, and uh, approaches were about images, actually. Uh, language. Uh, was a tougher job. Why? Well, because in an image, you have all the information read, information here already in the image. Uh, the context of one pixel is the other pixels around and the other pixels in other images. Uh, for language, the context of a word or a sentence is something that was previously uh, written in a text or that will maybe come later on. So to interpret uh, a given sentence or a given, even a given word, you need to have a, a large context from preceding and sometimes succeeding uh, uh, successor uh, uh, words. Uh, and this is a major difficulty because there's, there are a lot of ambiguities in language and the uh, context actually enable us to interpret. So the idea here is that the meaning of a word or the semantics, I'm putting semantics between codes because it's not real semantics, I'll get back to that. The meaning of a word uh, is 
uh, determined by the neighboring words, the other words, the other sentences in which, with which it, it's, it's uh, present. Uh, and uh, a new architecture invented by uh, in this paper called Transformer enables to address this uh, interpreter interpretation by injecting actually uh, a proper context. So uh, now uh, when large language models were built based on this approach using these uh, archi this architecture called Transformer, uh, it follows globally the following uh, a process. First, you take large amounts of data, which means really uh, astronomic amounts of data, uh, using and, and use self-supervised learning process for pre-training, for training a neural net, which has a transformer architecture, to build a model, actually it's a statistical model, of this data. So uh, those who build uh, LLMs, large language models, take data on the internet from many, many sources available, uh, open sources or not open sources, uh, to uh, build their models. Uh, so you consider that you have uh, billions of, of, data, uh, of data that is uh, actually used. Then, uh, but the approach is that actually the data, which means text in, this, uh, in here, is, is not considered as such, it's decomposed into so-called tokens. A token is a sequence of characters. So for example, uh, if you go to uh, OpenAI uh, website, you can find the tokenizer. And the tokenizer works in the following way. You input a text, and this text is actually uh, something which is uh, copied from uh, uh, what OpenAI says about their models. Uh, the tokenizer transforms this text into this, which is the same text, but those uh, color um, uh, parts are tokens. They are not text, they are tokens, which means a sequence of characters. And they say that approximately you have uh, a token is four characters. It's not always the case. You have much longer characters, but this includes punctuation, uh, blanks, etc. Everything here is a character that is tokenized. Uh, in English, uh, very often, uh, a token corresponds to a word, but it's not necessarily the case in other languages. And these tokens are then transformed into numbers. Uh, so this, uh, these uh, 58 tokens are this uh, 50 se sequence of 58 numbers. And when you have a sequence of numbers like that, this is easy to translate into a vector. Uh, later on, which is uh, just a, a mathematical uh, entity that can be used for computations. So getting back here, text is decomposed into tokens. So you see just uh, between uh, uh, parentheses that at this stage, the meaning of the text has been converted into this mathematical representation, which is uh, this vector. Uh, now, when you want to use the system, you input queries called prompts, and uh, then uh, the, uh, they are also encoded in the same fashion as vector. So everything now is translated into a uh, specific space, which is this vector space, or uh, uh, a space that, that includes actually the information uh, virtually. Uh, and uh, then when uh, uh, the system is going to answer your prompt, it's actually similar in a way to uh, information retrieval, uh, more generalized. For example, when you go to a website or to a um, uh, Google, for example, to search for something, you input text, and uh, this is information retrieval. The, the system is going to compare what you have written uh, uh, in terms of keywords that are extracted and give you back some pages which include those keywords ranked. Well, it's similar in a way, uh, but the similarity is, is related to a computation in this vectorial space. And it's uh, an operation called dot product, which is a very simple operation in, 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 uh, uh, in um, algebraic geometry. But... Uh, it's just something that says, 
this, this is a vector, it's a line, if you wish, and this is another vector, it's a line. They are more or less parallel, so they are similar in a way, and if they are not, they are not similar. So the dot uh, product uh, uh, provides this information, and uh, then uh, uh, if they are similar, uh, it means that uh, tokens that are in the model uh, could probably follow the tokens which are in the prompt. Uh, the purpose of the system is to give you an output that probably follows uh, your prompt. So if you start a sentence or you ask a question, what is the answer of the system? It is a set of character, which is a, a set of tokens, actually, that probably follows your, uh, uh, your input, your prompt. And then the system is going to answer. And this reiterates, so also what it has uh, issued will be also an input to follow and com uh, complete uh, its answer. So it's basically comparing statistically two sets of numbers. Now, uh, in this figure, uh, I try, it's, it's a complex figure, but it's easy to decode if you start from the left. Uh, it's, this is how uh, you can perceive the uh, process uh, and also the value chain the value chain is important because when we'll speak about regulation, we will have to define what the value chain is uh, to uh, uh, how the system works. Work. So here you have a massive amount of data, as I mentioned. And today, it's not just about uh, language. It's about any kind of data that can be also uh, processed, uh, including images, videos, computer programs, uh, speech, etc., so that the system can produce uh, different modalities, actually. And, and we are moving from large language models to large multimodal models. Uh, now, you have this data. The data is tokenized, embedded in vectors, etc. And then you have this, this is the uh, transformer architecture. And then you have this uh, self-supervised uh, pre-training uh, process. Pre-training because as you will see, it can be also retrained afterwards. But at this moment, we have this initial uh, trained transformer uh, architecture that has been uh, tra uh, transformed into a model. So this uh, bizarre uh, shape is the model. It's the model of what? Of this data. The statistical model of this data that has been uh, produced by the uh, um, self-supervised training process. <laughs> it's a context. <laughs> OK, so it's called uh, by for, uh, people from Stanford University called it foundation models. Foundation model because it serves as a foundation to other models. And then I'll, I'll speak about this later on. Uh, it's also called generative model because it's, it's going to generate, used, be used to generate uh, new data. It's also called in the AI Act, General Purpose AI Model, GPA, GPI, uh, model, General Purpose AI Model. So you have all these uh, uh, words uh, uh, designing it, designating it. Now, this model, if you put an interface to connect with it and input prompts, ask it question or a, a query for, for responses, it becomes, for example, ChatGPT. So the interface is just an interface where you uh, input the prompt. Uh, you uh, uh, ask questions, you, you, you want some, some answers, and it provided to you on your screen based on the principles I, I mentioned in my previous slide. But uh, if you do this, you are in danger of receiving uh, unsolicited, if I may say, a content. For example, things that uh, might be uh, uh, racist or uh, not politically correct, or whatever uh, uh, things that you don't want to, to, to have in uh, an AI system answering your uh, questions. Uh, so they added some filters to avoid this and also to uh, filter some of your, some of your prompts. It, it doesn't agree to answer anything, okay? 
like, I don't know, give me a formula to build a very powerful poison. No. Uh, um, uh, and it, uh, they added some models also to, to, to make some, some specific computations. All this is not disclosed. Okay, we don't know actually because it's a closed uh, system. We don't know exactly what's there. But we know that to build the filters, for example, they use a process which is called reinforcement learning with human feedback. Uh, and this means that humans are going to uh, solicit the system, query the system, and uh, rank the answers so that uh, they some answers which are not uh, acceptable uh, are not given after that, after their system has been uh, fine-tuned in this way uh, when, when it's going to be in use. Uh, this process use uh, workers uh, from Kenya, for example, or workers from um, uh, other uh, African countries, uh, and, uh, uh, and, they, and, and they're not well paid, and they need to do this, uh, of course, because they are paid by the, by the uh, um, number of answers they provide, et cetera. So this is, uh, by itself, is an ethical issue, actually. Uh, but also, uh, interestingly, uh, it uh, <clears throat> changes the behavior of the system to uh, use words which are common in those countries, English words even, and, and, and not common necessarily in, in, in the United States or in Europe. For example, there is a famous word which is dwell, 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 dwell. Uh, we dwell into blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the, if you look at the numbers of times this word has been used in the scientific literature, for example, there is an exponential growth since ChatGPT has been released. Uh, and actually, this word is very much used there and not here. Uh, and you see the influence, uh, uh, which is, well, uh, quite interesting. Uh, now, why foundation model? Well, because actually uh, this model is general purpose. It, 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 I would say it knows everything about everything, almost, but it knows not enough about specific domains. So if you want, if you are interested in a specific domain and you are, for example, a startup or a small company who wants to build, a, say, a medical uh, AI system to uh, uh, do uh, some uh, help in diagnostics, whatever, well, uh, the uh, approach is to retrain the system in, on data specific to your domain, for example, medical domain. So this is going to use a supervised learning approach. It's called fine tuning. And after that, the system, well, it's just still this uh, large language model, but it has some knowledge which is specific to your domain which means it's going to be more performant in this domain and uh, hopefully avoid some um, uh, wrong questions that, that the initial model could give. Another uh, thing that you could do, you could do both, of course, but another thing that you could do is to uh, connect it to a specific database from which it is going to search for answers. So it's not retrained, it's just a resource that is going to be used. And this is called Retrieval Augmented Generation, RAG. Uh, and therefore, the system can connect to the database to prioritize the answers correctly according to this data. So if this data, for example, is a proprietary data from your company, well, you are disclosing it to the company which provided the uh, large language model. Of course, you have to be aware of that. Uh, the interest also is that in this case, it can, the system can provide also reference uh, because uh, this one cannot. Uh, the, um, the, the sources, the uh, references, I mean, uh, anything that has contributed to the answer is completely, uh, I would say, mixed and there is no way to, to give immediate uh, resources or citations. In this case, it can provide citations. Uh, and to, to you can use the this, this system in, in some settings where uh, this kind of thing has ha, happens and you have citations. Okay, so now something which is interesting is to look at the value chain. So here you have a provider, the, the one who built this is a provider of the system. 
The one who put it on the market is the deployer of the system. And here again, when you do retrain it, you become provider and also if you put it on the market deployer. So the role, which means re responsibility with respect to uh, uh, regulation, is something that is important to, to, to understand who is provider, who is deployer. Okay, now second point, what are the issues and why actually we do need ethics and governance? So I'm just illustrating this with some uh, shortcomings of these systems. Now, uh, here is an interaction I have with ChatGPT. I put the date over there. Generate a realistic medical scan image showing lungs and liver, but not the heart. Absolutely not the heart. And the result is that you have a nice heart here in the middle. It, it's even better shown than the other organs. Uh, okay, I, I could say it says uh, it's it's a mistake. Something's wrong. But here's what uh, ChatGPT answers. It said uh, it said. Uh, here is the realistic medical scan image showing lungs and liver without the heart, if you need any medication, etc. So it says no heart here, and it shows heart here, meaning that, well, it doesn't, of course, understand what a heart is, probably, but it's mixing also true and false information in its answer. What do I believe here? Uh, that's one first issue. Another issue uh, multiply 397 by 719. And the product of is this number. Now that was chat GPT-4. And uh, a few, uh, about a month later, I used chat GPT-4.0, which is the updated uh, version. And same question, different answer. It's just a multiplication with three numbers, different answer. Both of them are false. Incorrect. So uh, it means even simple computations are not happening. I thought actually that uh, they would have a specific model for such computation, like a calculator embedded. No, it, it's just the probabilistics. That, yeah. Uh, and interestingly, there is some similarity. Okay. And this one uh, misses by 400 only. Uh, but a computation is a computation. I mean, a calculation is a calculation. It's not a statistical guess, right? Uh, so wrong answers, but also no repeatability. If it was consistent, that would be a little bit better, but no. Okay, now this one is uh, interesting. It was inspired to me from by, by uh, someone called Colin Fraser. Uh, so... You know this uh, puzzle where you have a farmer on the side of the river with a, a, a sheep, a cabbage, and, and a wolf, and uh, he wants or she wants to uh, cross the river and how many trips. So now the question is, a farmer stands on the side of a river with a cabbage, only a cabbage. There is a boat with enough room for one person and one cabbage. How can the farmer get himself and the cabbage to the other side of the river using the boat in the smallest number of trips. Inter in interestingly, uh, so uh, it says, let's break down the solution step by step. And by the way, step by step, it's a kind of keyword to instruct, I didn't put it, it put it, uh, to instruct ChatGPT to reason step by step, which means it focuses its uh, um, 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 computation in, in a way that yield uh, uh, better answers. So first trip, the farmer takes the cabbage across the river. Now the farmer and the cabbage are on the other side of the river, correct. Second trip, the farmer returns to the original side alone. Why? Because we, we have already uh, done what was requested. Okay, third trip, the farmer crosses the river again with the cabbage, but the cabbage was on the other side already. There was no cabbage on the first uh, side of the river. So, okay, so let's verify each, each step. Uh, uh, it describes uh, what's going on. The, the at first trip, the cabbage is on the other side. After the second trip, the farmer is back. And after the third, both are on the other side. Hence, the smallest number of trips required is three. 
So wash. Well, my uh, interpretation is that this uh, riddle is usually, of course, with cabbage and wolf and uh, sheep and requires three trips. So statistically, what comes when you ask this riddle with these words, etc., is three trips. So it invented three trips, okay? I mean, it's not reasoning like I just presented it, but that's the idea that in, in most texts that has been learned, you have this process of uh, moving uh, on the, uh, from the, uh, each side of the river and, and finally three trips. And of course, I mean, uh, everything here is, is completely uh, messed up in terms of interpretation, word model, whatever, nothing. And of course, no planning no correct planning and no word representation. So it means we have some limitations. These limitations, and I'm insisting on that, are inherent because of the very workings of the system, because of the principles on which is founded. You can reduce some things by, for example, removing uh, data which is wrong about the word. The problem is not the data is wrong. The problem is that you are correlating, correlating things and not reasoning. I mean, you, the system. Uh, correlation means uh, that you don't actually understand what's going on and you, make, you can make spurious correlation. So these are called hallucination in the community, which is a, a, a word I uh, strongly disprove because it's, it doesn't have anything to do with human hallucinations, which are a perception which is blurred or whatever about reality. Uh, this is not a, a wrong perception about reality. It's just the result of <clears throat> wrong correlations. So uh, again, one point is important. The semantics are in the context of the text that has been learned. The semantics are not grounded in reality. So, Let's not speak about semantics as if it is the meaning of the word, the meaning of the words and in the real word. It is the meaning according to the correlative process. So uh, this is a major limitation, of course, because uh, the problem is when you interact with the system, you have very plausible, well-written uh, answers, and and very often good ones, uh, very often very superficial ones, but still well written. Uh, so what do you do with that? And what do you do with that when you have no predictability? You interact once, and okay, we take the result. So you don't how how, how much is it predictable? You you don't know, uh, and uh, it, they include a mixture, as you've seen with the heart, of true and false information. So uh, which is which, which is wrong, which is correct. If you don't know what a heart is, for example, in, in that image, the system tells you there is no heart here. OK, you believe it. So you continue your medical studies. And well, uh, so uh, and this is, of course, a problem, because if you want to use the system, you, you have to be already in a way, specialist in the domain in which you ask, uh, in, in which you interact with the system, so that you can interpret if it's uh, wrong or not. So, but it, it's not the only problems, and, and you have general problems with statistical machine learning. So, not only generative systems. I will not uh, spend more time on this, uh, but but this is, I would say, classical, but but pushed into uh, something uh, more. Um, uh, how would I say, uh, more present in the workings of the system uh, because it's using language and not, for example, showing images, et cetera, because language is, is how thought, how ideas, how concepts are defined. And, and this is where difficulties come in. Uh, so, of course, biases are there. Um, uh, opacity and predictability and, and, and very little even non explicability for uh, generative systems. Uh, you have some explicability approaches that work in other domains, but here it's very difficult. And it has, of course, also a strong, high environmental cost because it's a lot of competition to build the data, to build the model. 
I mean, uh, month and month of computation to build the model. It's less time when you query it, of course, but it, 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 it's still consuming. And of course, storage and, and computations also uh, have not only uh, a cost in terms of um, emissions, they have costs in terms of water, for example, for cooling, and in terms of resources for building these uh, data centers. Now, uh, so I just want to point out that in, in the French National Ethics Committee on, on Digital uh, um, Ethics, uh, about a year ago, we issued this 30-page uh, paper. Now it's in French. It has been translated, but not published yet in English, uh, about uh, ethical uh, issues raised by generative systems. I'm listing some of them here. Uh, and uh, something I didn't speak about yet, for example, is attribution of human features. Because the system uses natural language, speaks in the first person, uh, you have tendency, it's a very natural tendency uh, with us, with people, to uh, project, to attribute a uh, personality to it and to attribute uh, human-like features to it, uh, anthropomorphize it. Uh, and this is, of course, um, uh, important as long as you are, even you, if you are aware it's an artificial system, because of the influence that it can have on you. you, you begin to be convinced about what it is saying because you project those human attributes. You think it thinks, uh, you think it understands. Uh, it's not the case. Uh, I'm not going to detail other things. Uh, I would like to, to, to leave some time to questions. So in the last part of my talk, I'm uh, going to present a few slides about how the AI Act addressed uh, these. So in the AI Act, we, we, we have the final text. It's going to be, uh, to, according to my um, knowledge, it's going to be published in the official uh, journal of the uh, um, EU uh, in uh, 12th of July. So we'll see. But, but the text is, is, is there, and, and we have it here. So uh, in Article 3 definitions, you have the definition, general definition of AI system. Okay, this is AI system. I'm not going to discuss about this definition, which is uh, also interesting to uh, analyze. Uh, note that the notion of risk is the combination of probability of an occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. That's very classical. Uh, the question is, how do you evaluate uh, uh, and compare harms? But uh, jumping to number 63, general purpose AI model, the model, OK, this the one that was here. Uh, is uh, defined as uh, a significant generality, wide range of distinct tasks. So it's not focused on a given use, it's uh, general purpose. And, and that was a major change actually in the initial text of the AI Act because the AI Act was based on the idea that each system had a specific purpose and that regulation was according to uh, how this purpose presented some risk. And here we have general purpose. So it was important to include this. Uh, so and um, so those systems can be integrated into a variety of downstream systems that, that I mentioned in the right-hand side of my figure. And it's important to notice that AI models that are used for research, development, and prototyping activities uh, are not, are not, uh, uh, are not included. Now, the notion of high impact capability, which will come up later on, means capability that match or exceed the capabilities recorded in the most advanced general purpose AI models. Now, that's an interesting definition because high impact is high impact. Uh, it's, uh, it, it has its high impact capabilities because it's the most advanced capabilities. So I don't know how this will be applied. Uh, now we can we know what are the systems which have a high um, uh, advanced uh, at w which are advanced, but the definition of advanced, etc., needs to be clarified. Now you have the motion of systemic risk, and the risk is systemic if it is specific, if it it, it is uh, of course it's high impact and uh, uh, it has a significant impact on the union market, 
uh, due to the reach or to actual reasonably foreseeable negative effects. So here we have something that is important because it is going to define uh, how you regulate those systems. And then you have general purpose AI system and not model, which is an AI system based on general purpose AI model. Okay, now let's see. Uh, systemic risk. Uh, it has high impact capability, a general purpose AI model, model, not, not system, okay? And, and there was a fight actually at the later, latest days uh, or month of um, the um, 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 negotiations about the contents of the AI Act about should you or not include models in the regulation? Should it be only systems put on the market or should you also imply models? And finally, models are included and specifically uh, models with systemic risks. So a systemic risk means high impact, uh, also a decision of, of the commission. And uh, uh, the um, uh, definition is that it is pre presumed to have high impact capabilities if the computation time for training is greater than 1025 flops, which means uh, floating operations per second. Now, chat GPT, for example, uh, chat chat, sorry, uh, GPT-4, which is the source for chat GPT, is uh, supposed, it's not, pub it's not uh, disclosed, it's supposed to have uh, three uh, multiplied by 1025, which means uh, chat GPT is included in this regulation. Whereas, for example, a similar regulation by the uh, uh, US uh, executive order uh, by President Biden last October says 1026, which means it's for future systems. It's not for uh, GPT-4. And also it means that it follows the idea that we will need more and more computations. Whereas we can also need, maybe uh, we can also invent uh, things that require less computation. Uh, uh, this is a topic of research. Okay, uh, let's me, let me move. Now, obligations of providers of general purpose AI models. Uh, so they have to provide technical documentation. They have to uh, inform uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, downstream uh, users. I mean, uh, those who intend to integrate the system in, in their own applications. Uh, they have to comply with uh, low on copyright and rated rights. That's already a, an issue which is, uh, which is challenge. And uh, they, have, uh, they have to make publicly available sufficiently detailed summary about the content used for training. So, and uh, obligations of providers continued uh, sh shall apply to providers of AI models that are released under a free, shall not apply, sorry, not apply if it's a free and open source software. That's important also to keep in mind. Uh, and something else which is important is this notion of codes of practice, which is one of the first steps that is going to be taken for the implementation of the AI Act. Uh, they, uh, and, and, and um, waiting for the complete deployment, I mean, enforcement of the AI Act, which will take three years, uh, already uh, codes of practice have to be defined. Uh, and um, uh, until a harmonized standard is published. So a code of practice are going to be the, the, the reference for uh, in the first uh, phase of the deployment. Okay, now uh, about systemic risk, uh, they have to provide, perform model evaluation with standardized uh, 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 protocols, adversarial testing, and assess, mitigate possible systemic risks. My uh, initial opinion on this, it will be very difficult, if not impossible. So what does, what does, does it mean to operationalize, operationalize this article 55? Model evaluation, adversarial testing with red themes, adver adversarial, assess possible systemic risks, identify serious incidents, and of course, cybersecurity protection, 
uh, I will not discuss this one. It's not so easy to do this. I mean, you need metrics for evaluations. We don't have this. Uh, people are working on those uh, topics, but it's, it's not today uh, uh, operational. Um, uh, you have to detect, for example, what if the output is really useful, uh, what is the similarity with context and evaluation of correctness? You need domain knowledge. Like, I mean, you know that a heart is here, for example. Uh, so where does this come from? How, how do you know if it's true or not? It's all very difficult, even you are, if you are a specialist, to, to de determine if it's correct or not. The repeatability uh, problem, how, how, how often you have to test the system to assess repeatability, what does it mean? Uh, uh, it, it doesn't come even close sometime. Uh, uh, does it, uh, how do you represent the actual performance uh, in, in this evaluation? Because it's not just by uh, using test sets, it's in putting it into operation in the real world. That's the point. Uh, what what kind of accuracy do you have uh, to uh, what what if you change if the performance is changed how how much is it changed uh, is statistical testing uh, significant these are open questions uh, uh, I have a paper here that I'm mentioning it's it's a recent paper uh, about red teaming and benchmarking and they uh, built. Uh, uh, so, some some benchmarking using uh, on on use cases, for example, detect wrong or inappropriate information about uh, cybersecurity, about uh, uh, including cyber attacks, uh, jailbreaking. You know, jailbreaking are prompts designated to obtain wrong or unsafe answers. Well, uh, and also they use synthetic data sets. Synthetic data sets are sets that are built from. Uh, real uh, data sets and, and they are questionable as well. So again, we don't have, we don't have complete answers. Uh, there are some obligations for providers of general purpose AI models. Again, uh, demonstrate compliance with the obligations that I mentioned, uh, but, but they are not, I mean, uh, stringent, okay. Now, uh, and the code of practice are being defined, but I will not um, go into these details, my time is off. Just about code of practice. Uh, I found this by the World Health Organization, published in last January. Uh, and it's uh, a guidance to large um, uh, models, large multimodal models. Uh, it's interesting that the WHO addresses the idea that when you have some risks, who is going to do what? So what are the developer actions, the government governance actions? This could start to resemble codes of practice in this domain, not completely, but uh, uh, I think also one, one interesting thing is that maybe code of practice could be also sectorial, not exactly the same in, any, in, in every sector. And that's my conclusion. Uh, I think they, these systems can be helpful if used by competent users, though you can distinguish true from false if you, if you have the ability to do that. They have inherent limitations. Uh, we don't have reliable methods for verification and, and testing. Uh, and um, of course, quality resources are important, but don't eliminate the problems. Uh, a code of practice, even if we have a good one, does not guarantee complete adherence. Yeah, I mean, you have many code of practice that are not really followed by those who issued them. Um, and uh, I think that it shouldn't be interpreted as self-certification, the uh, compliance with European Harmonized Standard, because self-certification is also an issue. Uh, uh, I think that uh, legal responsibility uh, should include the whole value chain actors, which means that uh, all the uh, actors from the beginning, and in addition, <laughs> uh, I think that general purpose models, not just those with systemic risk should be considered high risk because inherently they include those problems. Thank you very much.